Okay, good morning everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you're all feeling uh, bright to, uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed this morning. Um, my name is Charles Hoskins, so I'm the Regional Brand Protection Director uh, for LVMH, uh, based in Hong Kong, looking after this part of the world, focused on uh, grey market and, and counterfeit uh, issues for uh, a number of the, the houses for, for the group. Um, so I'll be chairing this session today. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Joyce is going to start for us as well. Joyce is from uh, HK Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and um, and then afterwards we have uh, Ada from uh, Hang Yang University uh, in Korea. So um, I think we'll be having a mix of discussions about, uh, firstly from Joyce about social signalling uh, and the impact of, of consumer behaviour in terms of. Uh, the purchasing patterns of, of counterfeit over genuine products for, for luxury. Um, and then I believe Ada is talking a little bit more about the digital component uh, online uh, issues uh, in terms of luxury. So um, let's get started. Let's go ahead. So please, Joyce. Um, thank you for the great introduction. Um, so I believe you, you have heard a lot about luxury brands in the past day and so. So to now we will um, move a little bit into fake luxury. So I hope um, you will also enjoy the a little bit insight about people who use brands but that are fake. So this work is in collaboration with my advisor, Amy Dalton, and Professor Jalen Hong in HKUS team. Um, we look into uh, consumers' emotional experience of using counterfeit and how social signaling can impact that. To start, um, I want to give you a definition of how we study counterfeit. So we define counterfeit here as products that are low-priced, illegal replicas of products that possess high value, high brand value. The brand value here is key. And I will elaborate a little more as I go on to the next slide. But as a background, counterfeit is really a global problem. Um, as uh, projected, the total economic value of counterfeit across borders would become a two trillion business just in a few years. And there are a lot of different types of counterfeits, just as yesterday I was talking to a representative from um, Hennessy and he's telling me um, even in food industry, even in wine industry, these products are highly counterfeited. Um, but there are different types of reasons that consumers use a counterfeit. We believe that in industries like wine and food, consumers are more like the victims of counterfeits. They intend to buy the genuine brand. They might think they are buying a discount product, but actually they bought a counterfeit. But in this research, we focus on a different kind of counterfeit consumption. That is consumer demand. So here we're looking at consumers who know that they are going to buy counterfeit, and yet they knowingly and willingly choose to do so. And this kind of counterfeit purchase is particularly prevalent in the fashion industry. So um, um, previous research has looked into this kind of what we call consumer demand or deliberate uh, counterfeit consumption. And they rightfully started from looking at factors that influence consumers' purchase motive. And one of the very major reasons why consumers would buy a counterfeit Louis Vuitton or a counterfeit uh, Gucci bag is, is so that they can use the brand's signaling value at a very low price. So they want to send to others. They are the kind of person who fit in the group that uses Gucci or LV, but they don't want to pay the price. Much less is known, though, about how consumers feel or what happened to their experience when they go on to use this counterfeit um, Louis Vuitton or counterfeit Gucci. And this is what we want to tap into in this research. And we particularly focus on their emotional aspect. So just to give you a preview, we have two major findings. When consumers are using a counterfeit, they are likely to experience what we call mixed emotions. And I will elaborate a little bit more in the next slide. But more importantly, this only happens when social signaling is salient. And, and also, the experience of mixed emotions will deter them from using a counterfeit in the future. So we will uh, elaborate on the managerial implication in our last study. So why may this happen? 
We know that um, these counterfeit users use counterfeit to send signals related to the brand. So we would probably assume to the extent that they believe the counterfeit LV is sending a signal to others, they probably would derive some satisfaction and therefore they will experience some positive emotions. But at the same time, because these users know that what they're using is a fake, there's always a risk of being identified. And when they're identified, they, they will be frowned upon. Therefore, there's always a fear or shame of using counterfeit because that also signals something negative about them. They are probably unethical, they are fake, and more importantly, they're probably cheap because they cannot afford a genuine brand. So this kind of positive and negative signal or signaling potentials will elicit what we call a mixed emotions. And importantly, when, one, when a person experiences both positive and negative emotions, these two valences of emotions do not cancel out um, with each other. They, in, they instead experience what we call an emotional conflict. So when does this happen? Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we, we believe that these positive and negative uh, emotions really stem from the signals that they intend to send, but that they also <coughs> unintended send when they are using the counterfeit because they know the counterfeit is a fake. Therefore, we believe that users are most likely to feel mixed when social signaling concerns are salient. This will lead to three specific um, predictions. One, we think that even though the resemblance of a counterfeit of, um, with its genuine product can send out positive signals and probably elicit satisfaction and positive emotions, to the extent that the user knows using a counterfeit is not socially acceptable or that he or she is violating social norm, that person is more likely to feel mixed. Secondly, even though the user might um, be motivated to use the product in public um, to show off, when he or she is actually in a public consumption setting, he, he or she will realize the signals he sent out could be mixed and others could identify them as a counterfeit user and therefore form negative evaluation. And therefore, in a public setting compared to a private setting, we also believe users are more likely to feel mixed. And finally, um, we also think that the user's individual difference in their motive of using brand would have an influence on their experience. And this is an interesting point because previous research has shown that um, Consumers have different reasons to use luxury brands. Um, they can use it to express their self-identity. They can use it because of the quality or functionality of the product. But one particular reason that's relevant here is, is social adjustive motive. We define it as a motive to gain social approval and to signal social status so we can um, uh, assume the logical extension here is that those who have a strong social adjustive motive would care more about others' evaluation of them and of the product they use. Therefore, to the extent they believe they can signal something positive would increase their positive emotions. And to the extent that they fear they will be frowned up on and they will be judged as a, a phony, that would also increase their negative emotions. So, so what if they feel both positive and negative? As I mentioned before, um, positive and negative emotions do not cancel out with each other. In addition, um, in, instead, they create an emotional conflict. This is an arouse, arouse um, psychological conflict that's uncomfortable and people tend to avoid. So we believe that the experience of feeling this emotional conflict in using a counterfeit may in fact deter consumers' uh, future counterfeit purchase intentions. And we will test this um, hypothesis in five different studies. I will try to go through the first three more quickly because they're lab studies and elaborate on the last two a little more in detail. So in the first study, we um, tap into perceived social acceptance. Um, we, we run this study in uh, Hong Kong UST undergrads and 
Um, just as a coincidence, last semester one of our professors is doing a consulting project with an eyewear company. So we kind of leverage that as our cover story and say a uh, anonymous luxury eyewear brand in Hong Kong would like to understand consumers' experience of counterfeit or genuine product of their brand. We didn't really use any uh, branded product because we, we want to avoid biases due to prior brand association. We just use this non-branded product, um, but we put our, con our participants into two groups randomly. Um, so one group is led to believe that what they're using is a counterfeit, and the other group is led to believe what they're using is a um, genuine product of this anonymous uh, branded, uh, branded eyewear product. So we handed them a pair of sunglasses and we asked them if they would be willing to try it on and all of them agree. And then we took them to an outdoor area outside of our lab and asked them to put on the sunglasses for a few minutes. And then they came back to our lab and uh, reported how they felt. We measure mixed emotions. We also measure positive and negative emotions throughout our studies. But in this presentation, I will just focus on our results on mixed emotions. So as we predicted, um, can counterfeit users experience um, more mixed emotions to the extent that they believe what they're doing is violating social norm. That is, uh, using a counterfeit is socially unacceptable. But as uh, we would expect, their perception on the norm regarding using a counterfeit would not affect their emotions if they believe they're using a genuine product. So then we move on to the second study to tap into our second factor, public versus private counterfeit, um, uh, public versus private consumption setting. And in this study, we use a scenario imagination instead. We ask our undergrad students again to imagine either using a counterfeit, uh, I, I believe we use uh, Abercrombie and Fit um, sweaters because that's a very popular uh, brand in our undergrad. And, and we also don't want to use something that's out of reach because I think if we ask them to imagine using like a, a Prada or something, that it, it, it might elicit emotions just because it's unrealistic. So we use Abercrombie and Fitch and we ask them to imagine using either a counterfeit or a genuine product either at a class uh, picnic or at home to manipulate public versus private consumption setting. After they spend some time to imagine this scenario, we ask them to report how they feel. And also more importantly, we ask them how willing they will be to purchase any kind of counterfeit in the future. And as we expected, um, those who imagine using a counterfeit, they felt more mixed when they imagined doing so in a public setting than a private setting. Consumption setting really didn't influence their mixed emotions in genuine product because one would imagine I would probably feel pretty good if I'm using um, a genuine product, whether I'm in public or private. Um, but more importantly, we find that the mixed emotions evolved in just simply imagining using a counterfeit in public can negatively um, influence their purchase intention in the future. So to the extent that they felt mixed when imagining using a counterfeit, they reported a less willingness to purchase a counterfeit in the future. So um, moving on, we want to tap into our third factor, that's an individual motive factor, social adjustive motive. And the experimental setup is pretty similar to uh, with the previous experiment. It's again an imagination exercise. We ask consumer, um, our participants to imagine either a genuine or a counterfeit um, sunglasses and we ask them, them to imagine using it in a public setting and then uh, they reported how they felt in imagining this consumption experience and they were also reported their purchase intention um, toward counterfeit in the future and at the end we measured their individual difference of uh, social adjustive motive. And here we see that those who imagine using a counterfeit, if they hold a strong social adjustive motive, again, that's a motive to signal status, to impress others, or to gain social approval, they actually 
felt more mixed emotions than if they have a low social adjustive motive. Interestingly, we also see that for those who imagine using a genuine counterfeit brand, uh, a, a genuine luxury brand, um, their social adjustive motive decreased the extent to which they feel mixed. So we tap into our discrete emotions measure, which I'm not reporting here. Um, but we see that if you are someone who has a, a strong social adjustive motive and you're imagining using this genuine luxury brand, you only feel positive. And therefore, the pure positive emotions would decrease the, the mixed emotions. And again, we see that the mixed emotions elicited in imagining using a counterfeit um, have a negative impact on their future purchase intention. So in so far, we observed some evidence in the lab, but one might ask, so what? Because consumers in the real world who use counterfeit chose to do so. So one could argue that those who knowingly or willingly chose to use a counterfeit actually wouldn't feel any mixed emotions at all. So to tap into that, we are um, serving a, a, a group of self-identified counterfeit users on our campus. So to um, track them down. So do you have a list? That, <laughs> that would be unethical, but I do have a list. <laughs> so we send a campus-wide email to all staff members and students, and we ask them one simple question. Have you ever knowingly and willingly used a counterfeit product in the past, I don't know, maybe year or two, I forgot the exact time. And out of those who said yes, we then um, described our main study to them and asked if they would like to participate. And 54 returned um, our survey and participated. So we asked them to just uh, describe their emotional feelings and their experience of using counterfeits in the past um, in, their, um, in their own counterfeit experiences. Um, but we separate two types of counterfeit um, experiences. We asked them to describe their uh, experience of using a public counterfeit good, such as shoes, wallet, bags, as well as their experience of using a private counterfeit good. And they describe their experience, uh, the, their experience in an open-ended format. So then we conducted content analysis on both the major themes that are mentioned, as well as the emotional components that are mentioned. In terms of the themes, um, we see that comparing public and private uh, consumption experiences, these three themes. Um, all come up. Saving money is the most important benefit one would use a counterfeit. Um, and they, they all mention a little bit of concern about morality, but to a much lesser extent to, um, than the benefit of saving money. They also mention a little bit about concern um, with quality, but also to a lesser extent compared to the saving money benefit. But interestingly, what we see is when it, when it uh, comes to matters related to social signaling, only those who, um, only in their responses of um, their experience uh, of using a counterfeit in public, they mention any sort of social disapproval concerns. At the same time, only when they are recalling their experiences of using a counterfeit in public, they mention enjoying the brand's signaling value. So here we see some direct evidence that when they are using a counterfeit product in a social context, they are aware of the positive and negative signals that they can send out. And our um, we also uh, we also um, did a content analysis on their emotions, and this uh, is similar to what we found in our lab experiment. They mentioned feeling more, more of them mentioned feeling mixed when they're describing a consumption experience of a public versus a private counterfeit good. So what are the implications of the, the studies we have in so far? We know that can, uh, counterfeit users can feel mixed, and we know that feeling mixed can um, reduce their purchasing tension. So we think one insight might be Consumer intervention strategies could probably be designed in a way to make salient social, social signaling concerns in counterfeit consumption, and that might be an effective way to reduce counterfeit demand. But before we really test out our approach, we went ahead to see what are the existing anti-counterfeit strategies in the market. So we did a little bit of um, Google image search um, using the keyword anti-counterfeit campaign, and we coded the first 200 um, messages or, or images that showed up. And we found that majority of them 
are related to uh, brand um, counterfeit awareness. So these are probably sponsored by um, NGO or uh, uh, brands uh, just to increase the awareness of the existence of counterfeit products. 30% um, of them also teach consumers how to identify a brand uh, versus a counterfeit. But these two types of messages really are targeting consumers who are victims of counterfeiting rather than who are a compass of uh, counterfeiting. Um, and for the rest of the, the messages, we do see them tapping into consumers who intentionally purchase counterfeit. 9% of them tap into moral issue um, by telling consumers that if you choose to buy a counterfeit, you are actually supporting crime and child labor. But only 4% really tap into social signaling issue, as uh, we, we would suggest. So we created our own ad and to test whether really making salient social contacts can reduce consumers' uh, willingness to purchase a counterfeit. So we designed these two ads um, and we asked uh, our participants to imagine how they would feel using a counterfeit. And the, the two ads are the same as you can see, except that one has a social background and the other doesn't. And then we also adopted an ad from um, the real world, which is the most common type of in uh, intervention ad just um, to increase awareness. So we pit these three ads against each other. Um, and to do so, we have our participants uh, randomly put into two groups. One group really just reported their willingness to pay for a polo shirt, both a genuine and a counterfeit uh, one. And for our critical experimental group, we exposed them to one of our ads. And then we asked them their willingness to pay for both a genuine uh, polo shirt and a counterfeit shirt. And our key DV here is the price premium or the relative price that they are willing to pay more for a genuine versus a counterfeit product. I will quickly sum up our findings. Um, so what we see is essentially, compared to seeing a non-social ad or an awareness ad or comparing to seeing no ad at all, if they are exposed to an ad that makes salient the social context they would um, encounter when using a counterfeit, this exposure actually increases their willingness to pay for a genuine polo shirt relative to a counterfeit. So we can interpret this data as um, they would value a genuine brand more after they actually consider their experience of using this counterfeit brand um, in a social context. So in conclusion, we find that even though consumers buy counterfeit brands to signal social status, when they go on to use a counterfeit, they actually will feel mixed, especially when social, con social signaling concerns are salient. And we identify three particular situations that this could happen. And importantly, the mixed emotions elicited in counterfeit consumption can reduce consumers' intention to purchase counterfeit in the future. And we have an implication for our marketers, that is interventions that are designed to make salient social signaling concern might be an effective way to curb counterfeit demand. And with that, I will end with a cartoon that sums up all the social signaling concerns of using a counterfeit. <laughs> Thank you. So I have to um, comment on that. We, we did not directly manipulate price here um, because we want to hold everything else constant. Um, but we actually did use, in, in the unreported studies, we used um, more high-end brands um, such as Gucci sunglasses. We also used um, Gucci wallet and we see consistent uh, results. So I would actually think if someone who buy a very high-end uh, lux um, luxury counterfeit, they are trying to signal to a group that they aspire to, probably not their in-group. And if they are using this counterfeit in front of their aspired group, this concern of being judged might be actually higher. Um, yes, they will feel positive because they're using this brand that they really love, 
Um, but at the same time, it's more they are taking a higher risk of being frowned upon and being judged upon. So, thank you. I have a question. Oh, sorry. In I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, in terms of have you considered um, uh, whether a transgender could chase motivation for counterfeits? For example, would a male be more willing to buy a counterfeit lace handbag versus a woman? So, um, are you saying um, would a male be more willing to buy a lady's handbag as a gift? Um, that we actually um, haven't tapped into that. That's uh, beyond the scope of our research. But I think that's a really uh, interesting point. Uh, we, I do think that um, the results might be different when you are buying something for yourself. You, you would be worried about the signals you send to others about yourself. But when you're giving a gift to others, it really depends on who the recipient is. If I'm giving a gift to my girlfriend, but I, I'm very upfront, this is like a joke and this is a counterfeit, maybe it's okay. But if you are, I, I, it's hard to imagine how one would feel if they try to give a gift to someone and pretend that's a genuine counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> I would think they probably just feel more fear. <laughs> there is also this other point about, you know, what is the emotional, uh, um, um, what is the opinion of a male seeing, you know, um, on, on their opinions on, on the counterfeit for a female versus something that they are buying for themselves because I think this is another angle to look at. It. Yeah, so that's a not just as a gift but as their their personal opinions and their emotions towards it. Because some people would think, well, you know, why not? You know? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a very good um, research question to tap into. We are not uh, looking at perception, but there are some work that looks at perception. I don't think there's any work about cross gender, but males it's normally it's female who look at the status group of a male to um, make inference about how attractive the male is r rather than um, male looking at a female but I think when it comes to counterfeit I would imagine some of the judgments will still apply um, such as are you a phony are you a fake but maybe there is a gender difference that we don't know thank you I've got a question for you if I may oh, sure. as I think the brand protection manager uh, as a Westerner living, I think you said in Hong Kong, mm, right. I would assume you see fakes all the time even when friends or family come visiting. Uh, how do you react? Do you see your brands fake? Do you close your eyes and run away? Or take <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, you want the real answer? Or yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in in one will be, won't you listen? Oh. No, um, it's interesting because I've been in this industry for, uh, for quite some time. So I think in, in my locus of close family and friends. Australians Astra who often buy fake brands when they travel. That, that's true. I mean, I've got, I've got friends you know, from, from all over the world, but, but certainly from Australia, families from Australia as well. Um, but they, because they're, they're used to, to knowing what I do and, and, and who I work for, so um, I think that they would choose not to tell me, and they certainly don't. Uh, they're not open about it. If it's something they do engage in, it's not something that they would they would directly uh, tell me about. So, um, because you know, I think they understand from my perspective and conversations they've had from me, you know, the, the implications as well. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, if I'm doing market surveys in in Shanghai or in Guangzhou or in Hong Kong, the number of Australians that are in those markets actively seeking to buy counterfeits is quite high. So. It is, it is disturbing. And actually, you know, at some point, in a recent example, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Shanghai, there was an Australian woman, or two, two women who were friends from, from Adelaide, uh, and I was doing a survey in a shop, and I felt like, you know, revealing myself and saying, do you know, you, you know what you're doing here? But uh, obviously the, the, the counterfeit store operator would have been alerted also to who I was. But, um, at a very serious level, do you take pictures? Do you follow up with local police? Yeah. Is it worthwhile? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, we do a lot of that, and that's uh, probably the core part of my role is to find out where it's coming from. But to, to Joyce, and Joyce will notice too that a lot of the focus is on the uh, the production and the supply, um, but the demand is it's there's uh, probably a lot less research done into into the demand and the motivators for demand. So I think it's a really important topic that we talked about today. And one one other follow up question I have is, what would you recommend and for the marketers and, and salespeople in the room as well? How would what would that advertising look like if it was to focus more on 
um, you know, that the, the exposure of ads more on the social context mm -hmm. part of it. How, how would be the best way to do that through, through digital? Or are we going to get to digital in a minute too? Um, I don't know about the platform because mm. we have no research on that. I actually have a few other studies that I didn't present here. Mm. We, so, so when we talk about social, ex, uh, social norm or social mm. signaling, there are two types of norm, whether people accept this behavior, whether they um, approve this behavior, or if people can tell this is a counterfeit. Um, because the, 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 the risk only relies on the chance of getting caught, right? Mm -hmm. So our initial uh, hypothesis would be um, counterfeit is so prevalent because they, the technology is improving yeah. and they look so much similar to the genuine product. But if we make it salient to the consumer that, hey, people can actually tell you're using a fake, mm -hmm. that would be effective. Mm -hmm. But in, I think we conducted two or three studies, that's actually not the case. All they care is whether they will be socially disapproved. Mm -hmm. They don't care if other can tell that's a counterfeit or not, as long as they don't think they will be frowned up on. Sure. Some of them even <coughs> mentioned, I would disclose to my friends this is a counterfeit mm -hmm. and I just meant it as a joke. Yeah. So we, in our other studies, we, sh we found that what's important is to emphasize the point that social signaling, uh, uh, using a counterfeit, is not a socially acceptable behavior. Mm. It's not something complying with your social norm. Mm. Now, this is a little bit of a challenge in markets that uh, social um, signaling is important, but at the same time, counterfeit consumption is very prevalent. Mm. And we actually conducted data across cultures, um, and we, we know that Asian market apparently is actually not the most um, counterfeit acceptable market. Um, mm. Places like Mexico is actually much worse. People, everyone almost accepts someone using a counterfeit. Mm. But we still think like uh, our lab experiments is within the same culture. There is still individual difference, varies within a culture. Mm. And therefore, if you can just emphasize and or educate consumers, not just to identify a counterfeit, mm. but also the value of using a genuine mm. or the harm of using a counterfeit just to make it very salient. This is not socially acceptable. Mm. We think that might be the strategy to go. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks. Any more quick questions before we move on? Just a yeah. technical question. Actually, in the first two or three studies, uh, is there any, like, uh, do you think it's also a fluency effect? Because when you make the counterfeit um, usage situation salient, and then people, your marriage is also the willing to pay for the counterfeit products. And so it can be like, um, behaviorally, it's more fluent to buy a counterfeit. Right, later. right. Um, so that's, that would actually predict against our result, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yes, um, we are not making a comparison between what, um, those who use a counterfeit versus those who use a genuine um, on their, their willingness to pay for a counterfeit. We are really comparing within counterfeit users, those who use it in public versus private, those who have a strong um, adjustive motive versus who have a low uh, adjustive motive. Mm -hmm. so, so the fluency issue, I, I, I hear your point, but the fluency issue should be controlled because everyone imagine the same um, consumption and it's just the context that varies or the individual motive that varies. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, in a sense, I'm kind of uh, curious if we have any hard evidence uh, dealing with counterfeits. On one hand, I can understand the producer who says, well, been building this brand for 150 years, I don't want anybody to copy it. Then we have other people saying, for example in China, imitation is the biggest compliment. And then we have other people saying, well, uh, those who buy a counterfeit, uh, will, they just don't have the money to buy the real thing. Or those who buy the counterfeit, they will move up to the real thing later on. So you kind of have an early adopter in a sense. So all this talk, I've never really seen kind of numbers that says, well, it's good for Louis Vuitton that Joe Sixpack is wearing that bag. Uh, uh, so do you have any, I mean, that we don't know? So all of the above of what you said is, is true in terms of the observations that you just talked about. Um, but I think that's one of the hardest things that we have to deal with or in, in my job in my industry is that, you know, counterfeiters don't publish their books, right? They don't pay tax. They don't, you know, they're not registered. They're operating the black market and the grey market. So um, it's very hard to to quantify. And actually, Joyce led at the beginning some statistics that a lot of uh, international organisations 
uh, are able to try to measure the impact and the cost of counterfeiting. So there is some data out there, but it's, it's debatable on, on exactly how strong it is because there are not that many data points to rely on. I think customs are able to, to have seizures at borders and that probably comes, uh, becomes a high um, proportion of, of uh, contributory, contributory data to, to those sorts of analysis. But, right. uh, uh, yeah. So one question, yeah. there's, this, this, there's this counterfeit, there's the counterfeit consumer, mm -hmm. that. so yeah. is she a future consumer of Louis Vuitton, the real thing? Or is she deluding the brand? I mean, this is it's a great question. I think it's it's probably uh, um, very difficult to know. But uh, I don't know. Do you have any insights on yeah, that? Yeah. Um, so so I have two points um, on that. Uh, one is on an aggregate level. There's actually research on uh, the availability of counterfeit on the brand's both equity and perception. So the finding is mixed. So for example, there's uh, research shown that if a, a product is very high end, precisely to your Point, um, the consumers who use the genuine product and the consumer who use the counterfeit might be separate markets. Right. So in that situation, imitation is the biggest flattery and the availability of a counterfeit actually have an advertising effect of the genuine brand because the consumers will say, oh, this brand must be very popular and very well liked to for it to be so widely counterfeited. Um, but this is not the case for um, brands that are relatively middle or lower end because then the counterfeit and the, the genuine brand would become a substitute. But that's not luxury. Right, it, it's not luxury, it's just popular name brand, mm -hmm. yeah. And to your uh, question about whether they will be switching, we don't have data to tap into it, but um, our last study is about relative preference or relative uh, willingness to pay. So we have a conjecture. We think that some counterfeit users, and, and it's important because our work uh, compared within counterfeit users, so we don't think all counterfeit users, but some, who care so much about social signaling after they experience using a counterfeit once or twice and in experience this emotional conflict and maybe other concerns too, they might be more likely to switch. We will need longitudinal data to really speak to that, but I think there are qualitative work based on interviews that also um, hint to the same congestion, at least. Yeah. And for example, if the counterfeit consumer could be a future customer, I say, well, uh, why don't I give you a loan and then you get the real thing? <laughs> no, I mean, kind of create strategies yeah. to get the consumer into uh, the Louis Vuitton instead of uh, uh, kind of taking their pictures. I would uh, recommend you take the ad, but just get the names and then make them an offer. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah well, an interesting concept. But yeah. In two years, we know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank I think you. we should wrap it up there. Thanks.